You are now listening to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. Monday morning matters. Perspectives from, from Southeast, Southeast Asia. Asia. Hi, this is Arlene, and you are listening to Duran ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. Today on our Monday Morning Matters, we will discuss on Malaysia's economy. As we all know, Malaysia's economy, and including the regional economy, is not doing very well, and there are some external and internal factors that is contributing to the Malaysia's economic spiral. With me is Jayan Manan. He's the lead economist of trade and regional cooperation with the ASEAN, with the Asian Development Bank. So first of all, hi and welcome. Hi Arlene, uh, good morning to you and your listeners. Mm. Um, before we kickstart our discussion on Malaysia's economy, perhaps a bit of an, of an overview uh, from what uh, we see right now with the global economy and how it, it is affecting the regional and especially with Malaysia. Right, sure. Uh, I guess uh, one thing that's very clear now is that um, um, the China slowdown is having, uh, well, the first thing, the China slowdown is real. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we know that it's significant. Um, we're still a bit unclear about the true depth of the slowdown, but there are indirect indicators that suggest that it's worse than the reported official numbers uh, are uh, portraying. So it's a real slowdown uh, that we're concerned about. Um, on That's the first impact. The second is that... Um, that uh, slowdown, whatever, however slow that might be, is having a bigger than expected impact on the region. Mm-hmm. The early signs of that are already evident that it's having a much bigger impact. Mm-hmm. So both factors suggest um, that uh, the the news might be more negative uh, rather than positive going forward. And the region in Southeast Asia, and especially Malaysia, we have been relying a lot with China on trade. And part of the slowdown is the slow in export. Uh, from the China side, why there's a global slowdown and why is attributed to China? Um, okay, so China, I guess, um, has, is going through a number of uh, structural sort of adjustments internally as well. It's becoming less trade-oriented uh, by design. It wants to shift the um, sources of uh, demand or growth, if you like, from external to domestic. That is by design. It sees itself as being too heavily trade-dependent. And so uh, it wants to reduce that. So that's one factor. The second one is that, I mean, there's been, you know, China's been growing at a very fast rate for a very long time. And this could could not continue (laughs) indefinitely, (laughs) right? So sooner or later, it would have to slow a little bit. You know, even now, the growth rate is very healthy, but it's slowing compared to a very high rate of growth for a long time. So this is basically... You know, coming back to a more sustainable level of growth, if you like. Um, so, but uh, since we got so used to a very fast growing China, uh, we're feeling the impact of even a small slowdown. I see. And this was expected by countries in this region that, you know, one day China will not be as uh, active as before when it comes to trade. Yes, uh, people always uh, expected that, but they never wanted it to actually happen. (laughs) Yeah, and China is so big that there's not that much you can do. It's the largest trading country in the world. So, and it's linked in with, um, you know, the uh, regional supply chain, Mm -hmm. um, the uh, value chain in in the region itself. So, uh, So, sooner or later, you couldn't really prepare too much for the slowdown. It was going to have an impact on you, whatever you try to do, uh, because when you know you've got um, a huge trading partner like China, you can't diversify away that uh, risk. It's mm-hmm. co- it's going to bite one way or the other. 
And another slowdown that is uh, still quite a problem to Malaysia is the the, the continuous falling of uh, oil prices and, or oil demand. Um, do you foresee this uh, going to be for a longer period? Um, it's difficult to imagine that this will be, you know, a short run phenomenon. Right now, it looks like um, oil prices have uh, adjusted to a lower equilibrium level. Again, they were very high uh, before uh, and for quite a long time. I mean, um, I, I'm not an expert on forecasting oil <laughs> prices. I don't think there are many experts really who can do that. But it does seem like uh, there's not going to be a return to, you know, the 100 plus prices for quite some time yet. So I think we have to get used to uh, prices around this range for for quite a while. Mm. And because of that, um, what we are seeing for the next year's budget 2016 is government have already cushioned uh, the uh, the country's uh, GDP coffer by introducing taxes like GST to somehow replace a partial of the oil revenue that we used to uh, enjoy. Do you think this is something that is good for Malaysia to survive the economic regression? in the coming years. Right, yes. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, the GST is certainly um, going to be a buffer when it comes to um, replacing some of the lost revenues from oil, uh, the drop in oil prices. Although the GST has been on the cards for a while now. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's just a happy coincidence that uh, this has, uh, you know, come at a time when Malaysia has had to look to replenish its coffers, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if this was planned that <laughs> well. It, it wasn't. I thought it was planned yes, because of... Um, I think they planned to broaden the tax base, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a good thing uh, for, uh, you know, moving the incidence of taxation uh, to a broad-based consumption source. Uh, but... Uh, as you know, I mean, consumption taxes um, are a bit regressive in the sense that, you know, the poor or the lower income uh, groups tend to pay a disproportionately higher share of the total uh, because they actually spend a lot more mm -hmm. of the income uh, than, you know, higher income people who save a lot more and so are not subject to as much uh, of a burden as a proportion of their total income. So it's not the most fair tax, but it's certainly a highly efficient tax. Um, and also it's one that's quite um, inelastic in the sense that um, it doesn't uh, it doesn't fall sharply when uh, growth slows down. You know, the simple reason for that is, you know, we continue having to consume uh, uh, a minimum amount of food and clothing and all these essential items, whatever happens to the economy. So it's uh, quite a resilient uh, source of uh, revenue raising uh, for the government. And it'll be very handy, I think, um, in light of this uh, massive drop in oil prices. So I guess the government is trying to be more pragmatic with uh, the way it generates its income. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's a Kazana research. They found out that uh, when it comes to uh, when you you mention about uh, people who are from the lowest percentile of um, uh, income group, usually uh, the majority of the expenditure will be on food, and another one is on transportation. Of course, we see GST. We are also seeing the increase in the cost of living, most notably in the cost of transportation. You see the increase, in, in the hike in toll, and and the hike in uh, the LRT services, and not including the taxi fare as well. Um, the overall, do you see that with the budget 2016 is able to address cost of living effectively? Um, I think um, the budget at this time is probably not, um, uh, you know, a, a useful instrument to deal with those issues. I mean, what we have is a situation where the government is faced with trying to pump prime the economy when global 
economic conditions are slowing, uh, while at the same time, for a number of reasons, um, the uh, uh, the ringgit, the currency, has had a massive uh, devaluation. Um, and this will sooner or later feed into uh, prices um, of traded goods first, but then non-traded uh, goods will also respond to some extent. Uh, we haven't seen the full impact pass through yet to uh, prices, but that will uh, eventually happen. The only moderating influence here on, on the cost of living and inflation uh, is the drop in a few fuel costs uh, mm-hmm. and oil prices, which actually feeds into a lot of things indirectly. Uh, all our industrial goods and even uh, many of the consumption goods uh, so that will offset part of the uh, de- uh, impact of devaluation. But overall, I think we'll see um, inflation rising rather than falling, I unfortunately. See. So not good for the cost of living, especially for the lower income groups. Mm-hmm. Currently, what kind of economic um, indicator that we are facing right now, negative in- economic indicators? Uh, so, sorry, uh, can you say that again? Currently, what are the oh, economic... Right, currently, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, I guess uh, if you're looking at uh, the challenges for Malaysia right now, um, it you know it's on a program to try and sustain economic growth going forward. So the government has, you know, revised down its growth rate from uh, down to 45 to 5.5%, right? Um, so this is a step, quite a uh, steeping decrease in the revision, uh, but it could be a lot lower um, as things unfold. Um, apart from that, I guess we've got a budget deficit that's expected to narrow to 3.1% of GDP. Uh, that is a bit um, uh, ambitious in my view. I find it difficult to see how the government is going to be able to really narrow the deficit when it's increasing spending and um, it's actually looking at, um, you know, a slowing overall growth rate. Mm -hmm. So unless it's a big boost from the GST, this is uh, unlikely, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, The current account surplus is also uh, expected to narrow. It's almost getting down to balance now. Um, So this is a reflection of how uh, I guess exports might slow going forward. Um, what I find, um, you know, a, a bit more um, sort of uh, difficult to uh, square the circle is some of the government's uh, expectations about um, investment, private investment in particular. Uh, they are uh, forecasting a growth rate of about 7% in private investment, and this is hard to imagine right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that they're planning a large uh, spending program through the GLCs, and the GLCs investments actually get counted as private investment uh, when it probably shouldn't be. But even then, um, the kind of expectations for increased FDI and private sector, private investment seems a little bit unrealistic, a little bit too high. Uh, this is also true in the 11th Malaysia plan. And I fear that um, all of this might uh, not be fully realized and therefore growth itself might be a lot lower than the government is uh, projecting. I see. Interesting. We will continue the discussion after this break. Monday Morning Matters Perspectives from from Southeast Southeast Asia. Asia Hi, this is Arlene and you're back with me on Durian ASEAN and of course with Jayan Men and the lead economies of trade and regional cooperation with the, with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, continuing our discussion on Malaysia's economic spiral, um, in one of the articles that you wrote, you mentioned that there's a massive layoff that is happening right now in the banking industry. Uh, which is actually a sign of a slowing regional economy. Um, talking about uh, the health of 
this region's economy, especially with the upcoming establishment of the ASEAN Economic Community, uh, would this uh, some would this sign of a slowing regional economy affect uh, the region's economic ambition? Um, I think certainly um, it's uh, bad timing as we try and uh, establish the ASEAN Economic Community and all the reforms that are involved. Uh, reforms are most easily implemented during good times rather than, uh, uh, you know, slowing or bad times. So that's not uh, a very lucky uh, set of events. But um, uh, the slowdown, the layoffs you mentioned uh, reflect uh, partly this uh, growth slowdown in the region, but there's also, you know, ongoing restructuring uh, in the financial sector where, you know, a combination of technological change um, and other sort of cost uh, factors are driving this sort of uh, more uh, lean uh, uh, labor uh, uh, labor force in the in this industry. So, so there are. So what you are saying is the banking industry in this region is facing uh, metamorphosis, sort of evaluate. I mean, evaluating itself how it can somehow fit into the future of banking rather than uh, the slow growth of the regional economy. That's right. Uh, what I'm saying is, there's a bit of both happening. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's, uh, yeah, restructuring going on to make them more efficient. I mean, you know, financial services is probably the most competitive uh, sector of any sector, right? You have to be globally competitive going forward, especially when you start opening up to um, competition at home, as the AEC and other sort of arrangements are trying to do. So you have to be um, cost efficient. And these are uh, uh, adjustments to try and improve uh, competitiveness, as well as this uh, slowdown coming on top of that. So uh, both factors are operating, I think. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned about uh, a lot of the foreign investors are getting out of Malaysia and they are not seeing Malaysia as an attractive investment spot. Uh, How would this actually affect Malaysia, especially Malaysia's ambition to uh, be a hub, uh, a financial hub in this region? Right. So Malaysia, since 2006, has been a net exporter of capital. So there's been more uh, FDI leaving the country than coming into the country, right? Um, and that trend has never been reversed. Uh, we saw uh, uptick in foreign investment a few years ago, a uh, number of factors for that, but FDI has never really come back to the levels we had before the Asian financial crisis. Mm-hmm. So there's been a trend change, a trend decline in FDI. Um, there's also been a lot of capital flight uh, I mean, these things are difficult to measure because of the nature uh, of the beast. I mean, you know, these are often not reported officially, but um, the groups that have worked with the IMF in the past have come out to try to measure this, and Malaysia is up there almost at the top of the list when it comes to capital flight. So both portfolio and FDI uh, investment seems to be leaving the country, um, and um, um, we need to try and, uh, uh, you know, reverse or stem that trend. And I think until domestic policy changes are put in place that improve the investment climate at home um, and encourage foreign investors to come back and invest in these sec- industries again, uh, that trend was probably going to continue. Mm-hmm. But how can the government actually repair investors' confidence when it, it is facing so much uh, political backlash, especially on the issue of 1MDB? Right. So I think um, there the are two different things here. One is um, you know the domestic politics, which is sending a negative signal as you correctly point out, to everyone, including foreign investors, right? Uh, Second is the 
uh, reform momentum, right? Uh, now, there was a build-up in reform momentum a few years ago uh, with the new economic model and the 10th Malaysia plan uh, and everything else that was linked up with it. Uh, that seems to have slowed and in some cases come to a halt. Uh, that's very unfortunate. Um, there was also a uh, explicit program to divest from uh, government link corporations. So this was government uh, set targets to actually reduce the role of GLCs in the domestic economy. Uh, but unfortunately, again, uh, while there's been some divestment, there's been new investments in new sectors. So it's become more a program of diversification the divestment of GLCs. And it's these sorts of um, uh, reform fatigue uh, setting in, I think that's uh, preventing a return of foreign investors. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we'll take another one short break. When we return, we'll discuss further on Malaysia's economy. Monday Morning Matters Perspectives from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. You're back again with me and also with Jayan Man and the lead economies, trade and regional cooperation with the Asian Development Bank as we continue our discussion on the Malaysia's economy. Uh, focusing on this time, the manufacturing sector, uh, you co-wrote a really interesting uh, research regarding on the structural regression of Malaysia's manufacturing sector and why this is happening and why you're highlighting it only now. Okay, so um, the paper you mentioned, uh, me and my colleague uh, Bernard Ern at ADB, what we did was we studied the latest uh, manufacturing survey mm -hmm. uh, that came out end of last year. Um, and what we were surprised to find was that um, within manufacturing, uh, electronics was no longer the biggest subsector uh, where it was for a long time. Now it turns out that uh, the biggest is oil refining mm -hmm. and the second actually is oil palm mm -hmm. processing. So electronics now comes third uh, on the list. And so... Uh, Only for the last five years uh, where it came to it or since when? Okay, so this um, survey actually covers the period up to 2012. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the latest data that's currently available from the survey, right? Mm -hmm. And from then on, I think there hasn't been that much of a change that's observable. Um, you've seen, again, like in the finance sector, even in electronics, some restructuring and some sort of uh, departure of foreign firms. So I suspect that not much has changed um, in terms of uh, what's happened between 2012 and now. But that's the latest data that, that's available from the survey. Mm -hmm. um, and so the point is, um, you know, why should we care about these sorts of structural changes, right? Um, normally, it wouldn't be uh, an issue, except that um, in these sectors, oil refining and oil palm processing, these are highly capital-intensive sectors. So the employment opportunities uh, uh, are quite limited. And on top of that, the kinds of jobs that seem to be available, um, and this is all uh, reported by the manufacturing survey, uh, the kinds of jobs are not really high paying jobs. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're, they're quite low paying jobs. Machine operators and so on, uh, are not, um, these are not good jobs with good wages. So, um, whereas in even electronics, it wasn't high value added activities. As we know, Malaysia failed to properly upgrade and move up the value chain. But still, there were more jobs and better paying jobs in electronics. So in that sense, this is uh, a regression uh, where we are going back as we did at the early post-colonial phase uh, to processing our raw material and commodities. So we are going back 
So we are going back to the yep. 70s where the government first introduced factories and machineries for, and people are just laborers to work under these factories. Yes, that seems to be what's going on within manufacturing. That's mm-hmm. right, yeah. Um, now, of course, um, you know, Malaysia aspires to be a high income country by 2020, as you know, with the vision 2020. And so it wants to have a, a higher share of services, high quality services, but that is uh, still uh, something we haven't fully realized yet. But the fact that manufacturing um, uh, the manufacturing sector is getting smaller um, and within manufacturing we are moving towards primary processing again both these uh, bad signs I think for a country aspiring to high income status mm-hmm. uh, but why Malaysia is facing this situation in the first right. place okay. you, when you mention about see. structural regression what are the areas that Malaysia failed Okay, so normally, you know, this is um, uh, what Teddy Roderick uh, has referred to as premature deindustrialization, right? So there is this whole field of study uh, of uh, countries that are going through this phase. And usually it's uh, um, a result of uh, exogenous or external factors like technological change. Right, mm-hmm. uh, or globalization or things of that sort. In Malaysia, it appears to be more policy driven, right? Mm-hmm. Again, yeah. because of the, you know, the reversal in the trend of foreign investment and, uh, you know, the contraction of electronics. Now, of course, uh, uh, commodity processing, um, has become more favorable because Malaysia has now invested more of its resources in these uh, uh, production of these commodities, oil palm and oil, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it's cheaper, of course, to do the processing close to where these things are actually produced. So you save on transport costs. Um, and so, um, but there's two factors. One is um, actually what's stopping uh, the growth of uh, other types of manufacturing, right? Such as upgrading in electronics. Uh, and second, what's actually pushing us towards these sorts of commodity processing. For the first, I think, again, uh, the policy environment is not attractive any longer to compete with other countries to attract uh, investments in, say, electronics. Mm -hmm. And Um, all the electronics uh, sectors, they are moving towards countries like Vietnam, I suppose, or the CRMB countries? (laughs) That's right. So Vietnam uh, has had rapid growth in um, its investments in these sectors. And now, uh, for the first time, uh, countries like Cambodia and Laos are also receiving mm-hmm. that kind of investment. And uh, Myanmar, I'm sure, as it opens up, uh, will also be competing for those sorts of investments. Mm. Um, with your research, does it show that um, Malaysia is no longer looking... Ma- at manufacturing as part of its economic GDP? Uh, with, uh, with the 11 Malaysia plan, does Malaysia actually have a plan for it? I think Malaysia once sees the role for uh, manufacturing to continue. Um, it can't be, it's too soon now to move too heavily into services. Um, it wants, it's focusing on services, but not without manufacturing. The problem here is um, uh, manufacturing is contracting while agriculture is growing, mm-hmm. right? So it's not like if manufacturing contracts because services, high quality services are growing, then that's a natural sort of transformation towards, uh, you know, an industrialized economy, mm-hmm. right? A high income economy. But here, uh, services are increasing a little bit but uh, it's agriculture that's taking up the space that's given up by the contraction in manufacturing. Mm-hmm. And how right. how would, how would that, sorry? Oh God. Yeah, uh, I mean, what I meant is, how would actually all these um, somehow affect the Malaysia's economy in the coming years? Well, I think um, you know um, the problem with all of this is that uh, this kind of standard of living 
that we hope for as a high income country may not uh, be realized by the majority of its people right mm. now getting to uh, high uh, to the threshold the cut off point for high income might happen by 2020 but you know we could be like saudi arabia right mm. saudi arabia is a high income country but you don't see that when you go there right <laughs> yeah it's not really, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, you don't have the same services, the institutions and, uh, the same sort of, uh, governance structures that you, um, expect from an advanced or high income country. Uh, and in Malaysia, there's growing, I think, uh, inequality, um, that's a lot of it's not easy to measure properly, mm -hmm. but underlying mm -hmm. growing inequality, uh, that is driving us towards high income status. So mm -hmm. it's not a very inclusive type of growth. Uh, and this, um, regression in manufacturing, uh, is one example of that process that's taking place of this growing gaps within the different, uh, parts of the population. Mm -hmm. Talking about growing gaps, Malaysia is also trying to grow its reach uh, to its, uh, in, t in terms of trying to get more of the world's economic pie by joining uh, quite a number of FTAs and of course the the most famous one or infamous one will be the TPPA, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, do you think it's too soon for Malaysia to say yes for the TPP? Um, I think, um, you know, we're waiting to see what happens with the negotiated text. Uh, I believe it might be out in, within a week now, mm -hmm. a week or so. And um, we have to see what Malaysia has really committed uh, itself to, right? Uh, as you know, I mean, uh, the trade minister in Malaysia has come out publicly and said that Malaysia has a lot of uh, carve-outs and uh, exemptions longer transition periods for the most sensitive sectors like uh, government procurement, uh, SOEs, and those sorts of reforms. So in that sense, maybe this won't be um, very difficult for Malaysia to implement because the hardest things have been sort of, um, you know, quarantined. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. But the problem with that is that most of the benefits mm -hmm. that come from these sorts of agreements come from making reforms in these sensitive areas. Everyone talks about improved market access. That's only one small part of, uh, uh, of the whole agreement. The real benefits come when you can use these agreements to implement difficult reforms at home, mm -hmm. right? And Malaysia seems to have uh, missed that opportunity by trying to, you know, uh, carve out these important uh, domestic reforms. I see. So at the end of the day, um, the how would all this, you know, the whole uh, different areas of changes that Malaysia is facing right now, and especially with the new plan of uh, trying to uh, look forward towards the 11 Malaysia plan, um, would Malaysia's economy be healthier next year? Uh, okay, it's a bit difficult to say <laughs> yeah, right now. <laughs> yeah, there's so many unknowns and uh, so many uh, things that are unclear, not just uh, internationally, but even domestically, mm -hmm. right? Um, we hope that, you know, things will be better, but if you're going to balance out all the existing information and risk, Unfortunately, I think uh, you are more likely to expect things getting worse rather than better right now. Or oh, another um, Saudi Arabia, you know, I suppose. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I think uh, this, uh, yeah, the whole policy settings um, and the opportunity to, you know, uh, make uh, important changes uh, in the reform area uh, seems to have been lost. I think that's the saddest part of uh, all of this. Usually faced with, you know, um, a crisis type situation, uh, governments in the past have been very pragmatic, mm -hmm. right? Um, but they haven't faced the same kind of political uh, sort of uncertainties that the current uh, 
uh, administration is facing. So maybe that's a that's a difference. But uh, in the past, when faced with difficult economic conditions, uh, the governments have been very pragmatic in implementing reforms. But this time, it you can't seem to see that happening. Mm-hmm. So this is why it's hard to be optimistic. But you know, if the international uh, economic environment does uh, improve, is doesn't um, you know isn't as negative as we currently expect, that could be an important sort of uh, buffer for Malaysia. But domestically, I can't see that the government is doing enough to help uh, improve those sorts of prospects. Mm-hmm. With that, thank you very much. Thank you also. Good to talk to you again, Ali.